Symbols and Society presentation entitled Symbols, Explaining, Using and Positioning. The purpose of this presentation is to introduce Victor Turner's theory that symbols, certain symbols in society are not just meaningful to us, but we spend a lot of time explaining what they mean. We use them in rituals and we think about the world through them. So the structure of the presentation is I'm going to look at Victor Turner first and then the Ndumbu people among whom Victor Turner did fieldwork, then look at being affected or afflicted by spirits, then, looked at the, then look at the Chishinga or forked stick and look at the idea of exegesis operation and position in relation to the forked stick and then I will conclude with a bit of discussion. So Victor Turner is one of the famous anthropologists of the 20th century. He belongs to the school of symbolic anthropology and within symbolic anthropology he, he is uh, situated with the interpretive anthropologists alongside Clifford Geertz, Eric Wolf in his version of Guadalupe and maybe Mary Douglas and he is situated in opposition to the structural symbolic anthropologists like Levi Strauss and Needham. His most famous book is The Forest of Symbols and within that book the chapter that stands out is Betwixt and Between the liminal period in rites de passage, or rites of passage. Now this is a famous chapter which has had influence outside of anthropology, in cultural studies, and in the humanities more generally. In it, he argues that people throughout the course of their life go from different states, such as being from unborn to born, from unmarried to married, from child to adult, from living to dead, and from ill or sick to healthy or well. Now, in all societies, there are certain rituals which transform you through from one state to the other such as from unmarried to married and these are called rites of passage so a certain kind of ritual called rites of passage now within the rites of passage there's normally a stage which we could call a marginal phase or what he calls the liminal phase or the limen and what happens in this stage is that you to take an example you go from being uh, in, the, in the passage from being an unmarried woman to a married woman you go through the stage of being a hen at a hen's night and a bride at a wedding. So though in those liminal period in that liminal period, your names um, your your status is transformed very quickly. And normally in those periods though all kinds of strange things happen, like the world goes topsy turvy. Um, instead of if you normally work in an office, you go to a strip club and get drunk. If you don't normally get drunk, you get drunk. So um, and you are sometimes humiliated by your friends or whatever. So these are um, transitional phases where things get turned upside down, and that's what he writes about in the um, Rites of Passage chapter entitled Betwixt and Between. I'm not going to look at that in this presentation. I'm going to look at something else, which is his work on symbols more generally. So that relates to his fieldwork amongst the, Z uh, the Ndumbu people of Zambia. You see Zambia's down towards the southern central uh, Africa. His population numbered only about 18,000 in the 1960s. It's a society with matrilineal inheritance, so you get your house and stuff from your mother, and your father's house and property goes to his sister's children. And it's also very local, which means when you get married, uh, if you're a woman, you go to stay with your husband, live with your husband's group. To make a living, they grow cassava and millet, but also importantly for us, they do hunting. Men go hunting. 
Now, the Ndembo people in their religion, they believe in the existence of ancestral spirits, which we will call shades, okay? So from now on, shades just means ancestral spirit. This is a term that Turner specifically uses, it's not general in anthropology. These shades affect you and cause misfortune, and you could call that an affliction. It can cause all kinds of misfortune, like you trip walking down the stairs and you bruise your cheek. Or you're riding on your bike and you slip over, or maybe more relevant to um, Ndembo society, you get a cancer, or you're infertile, or you're a hunter but you just can't catch any game, you keep missing your quarry. Now, within this sort of larger ancestral belief and belief in spirits in Ndembo society, there are what are called cults. Cults is a term um, which has a specific meaning in anthropology. It doesn't mean like uh, when the press talks about these so-called crazy cults where people go and predict the end of the world and um, have orgies and die, that kind of thing. It's not that kind of idea. If an anthropologist sees a religious movement which is recognised within the religious mainstream, which has special rules of entry, that is to say not everyone is automatically a member, and if they worship special gods or deities or spirits or saints within the religion, and they do that to get better luck, then we call it a cult. So a good example is the cult of Mary in Christianity. That is recognised by the Catholic Church. Um, the, not everyone automatically becomes part of this cult. You have to join it. Um, you worship a special deity, the Virgin Mary, or saint, as the term might be. And you do that to get better luck or good luck. So these um, cults have special fu functions and rituals. For example, you pray the um, Hail Mary um, to get good luck. Now, there are cults within Ndumbu not to worship Virgin Mary, but rather cults specifically for hunters. Now, hunters are only males, only men. And this is what happens. I'm a hunter and I go out, I'm an ordinary person, I go out hunting, ordinary man, go out hunting and I miss the antelope I was going for. I keep on missing them every time I go out hunting and I come home tired, exhausted, and everybody laughs at me. I decide that uh, the shade of one of my ancestors, who was a famous uh, hunter, has entered me and he's uh, I've been afflicted by him. So I go to a diviner and he confirms this. The diviner, or witch doctor if you like, says, look, the shade wants me, wants, the shade, the diviner says to me, look, the shade wants you to enter one of the hunting cults. And once you enter this enter this cult, you will be, all this misfortune will be removed. And then I join one of the two cults that are available for me. One is the guns only cult, for hunters who only use guns, and then there's another cult for people who use, for hunters who use guns, traps, spears, bows, arrows, that kind of stuff. So um, any means possible. Now, for both cults, at the very centre of the rituals is the forked stick or chishinga. And on this fork stick, I as a hunter hang my choice cuts of meat and these are for the shade that has entered me to eat and consume. So we see here an ilamba, a doctor, performing a ritual, before performing the ritual, divines into mystical causes of the patient's affliction by gazing into, the, so there's the diviner, there's the medicated wart he's looking into, and here's the hunter, and here's his shrine. Um, down the bottom you can see there's grass braids tied here, and I think here you can see um, a termite's nest. So this is the hunter, and this is really the representation of his shade, that's where his shade comes to eat. So looking at these forked sticks, or these chishinga as the Ndembo call it, Turner says there are three kinds of meaning. The first is exegetical. 
This comes from the word exegesis. You might be familiar with the term exegesis from biblical studies, where an exegesis basically means an explanation of the text. Um, so an explanation of the Bible. If somebody explains the Bible or writes about the Bible, what it means, that's an exegesis. There's also an operational aspect to the symbol, and that is the way it is used in rituals, as we just saw in the preceding slide, that photograph. And there's also the positional aspect of the symbol, which is how the symbol is used to make sense of the rest of the world and all the meaning in the world. So although Turner calls these three meanings, probably three ways to use symbols will be clearer. So one way to use a symbol is to talk about it, one way to use a symbol is to use it in a ritual, and one way to use a symbol is to look at the world through it. So first of all the exegetical meaning, which is what the end will say about it to Turner, to other anthropologists, and even to each other. And they'll say this kind of thing. Well, we call our fork sticks chishinga, and the word chishinga sounds just like the word curse in Ndumbu, and that makes sense because hunters are cursed. If I as a hunter go out and catch an antelope, I give the choice fillet to my mother-in-law and give the rump steak to my cousin, my cousin gets jealous and calls me stingy, and all the other guys who didn't catch anything are also jealous of me because I caught something. So no matter what I do, I'm always annoying somebody, I'm always cursed, and that's the fate of a um, hunter. So it's, it's natural that Tishinga, the name we get to fork sticks, sounds like the word cursed. Secondly, it's the they talk about the natural characteristics of the wood they use. They, they plant trees for their um, ancestors, for their shades, and they also put these fork sticks, these chishinga, in the ground. And they talk about the characteristics of these tree species. So we use musoli because it has the power to make things visible. We use musengo because it multiplies things like game or children. So to be a good hunter, you want to catch a lot of game, and you also want plenty of children. And we also use kapwipo or motete, and motete is evocative of either hitting or missing the quarry. It's like it's a tree that's called, um, you've got a tree that's called bullseye, you've got a tree that's called plenty of children, you've got a tree that's called visibility or something like that. And then they talk about the shape of the short, the, 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 um, the, uh, the shape and qualities of the fork stick. They say we make these from species of tree which are termite resistant and therefore they're strong, just like the hunter. We sharpen the ends of it, which makes it sharp with power, just like the hunter. And the white of the um, fork stick is white, which is healthy, just like the strength and health of the hunter. So think about that if um, you've got a team called the Tigers, like the Detroit Tigers or the Richmond Tigers or whatever it is, the Balmain Tigers. A fan of a sports team called the Tigers, we tell each other, and my tell anthropologists who ask us, that the team members of the Tigers and the fans are strong and bold, just like the Tiger, but they're fierce, they're tenacious, they're, and so on. So if I'm an anthropologist and I go to Detroit and I'm studying the, pe the fans of the Tigers, that's what they might tell me about their team, the Tigers. They're strong and bold, just like the Tiger. Also, species might come up. Uh, uh, imagine I'm, I'm a, a hunter and I'm starting up a macho hunting club in Australia. For its logo, I'm probably not going to use certain kinds of um, plant species. I wouldn't use a dandelion because it sounds like a dandy, which sounds effeminate and not macho. Similarly, pansy in Australia, I would sounds uh, effeminate again and not macho. But I might use something like an oak tree to symbolise the strength of my macho hunters. So species, um, the sort of species I choose, would also be part of the exegesis, the explanation. So somebody asked me, "What's the oak tree in your logo?" And I say, "Well, that symbolises the strength and." Um, and longevity of the members of the club. And I might 
the exegetical meaning also includes shape. So if you ask an Australian about what's that big star on the Australian flag, they might say to you, well, each um, point on that star refers to a, one of Australia's states or territories. Well, I've certainly heard that said. I don't know if it's true, but that's the kind of explanation people give about the Australian flag. So we've looked at the exegetical meaning, which is the way Ndumbu people explain their symbols, their fork tree, their fork stick or Chishinga symbol. Now I want to look at the operational meaning, and that's the way the fork stick is used in ritual, the way the symbol is used. What is done with it and who does it? So the main thing to note is that only a hunter who belongs to one of the cults may cut a chishinga or fork stick and together with other hunters they prepare shrines for their ancestor their hunting ancestors who have afflicted them uh, with fork sticks and if I catch shoot an antelope or uh, a rabbit I take my kill firstly to the shrine and hang bits, bits of meat on the shrine so sacred portions are placed on the Chishinga for the ancestor shade because after all my ancestor the great hunter helped me catch the antelope he deserves part of the meal or the zebra or whatever it was now probably the most interesting aspect for me is the positional meaning and by that Turner is referring to the way a major or nuclear symbol as he calls them like the fork stick nearly always relates to other symbols. So for major or nuclear symbol, we could think of like a Star of David for Jewish people, the cross for Christians, the version of Guadalupe for people in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that, is, uh, that we use the symbol to understand other symbols. So, for example, if you look at the Chi Shinga, the fork stick, the hunter sees in the fork stick the three features of the landscape. The fork stick re re reflects reality because the landscape for them has three aspects. The forests, which is the Chishinga itself, the termite nests, which are, which are in the base, and the grass plains, which are tied around um, the Chishinga or fork stick. So the, the three most important parts of the landscape are symbolized. And when you, if a endemic person looks at the landscape, they see those three things primarily. And that is through looking at the world through a chishinga, through a forked stick. So in other words, um, there are three kinds of meaning or three ways of using a symbol according to Turner. There's the way we explain the meaning of the symbol, the way we use it particularly in rituals, and the way we use it to organize other elements of meaning in our cultural system. So Let's apply this now to another key symbol, such as the flag of the United States for um, Americans. Now, I don't know too much about American culture, but what I know is from being a child and going to school at an elementary school, and that was a great experience for me. And so what I'm going to say now is what I remember from being told as a, as a kid. And we were told that there's a star on the flag for every state in America. And so I would tell my friends in Australia when I get back, oh, you know the American flag? There's a star for each state, and that's my exegetical uh, meaning. That's the explanation I give to the uh, flag. Then there is the operational meaning, the way it's used. And as a kid, I actually thought it was called the Pledge of All Legions. <laughs> I didn't realise it was the Pledge of Allegiance, which we used to get up every morning, put our stand up, face the flag in the in my elementary school classroom, put our hand on our heart and say a pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. That's as much as I remember. You can also see it in other kinds of like say countercultural rituals, such as like burning the American flag at protests, let's like, say during the well, uh, during the Vietnam War. So um that's the way it is used in rituals, either pro or anti-establishment rituals, you could say. Um, and I suppose if you want number three, which is the uh, positional meaning, 
you would say that when an Amer American looks at a like a satellite picture of America, they see the satellite picture, but they also see fifty or what fifty stars there too. So they also see uh, how can I put this? They see they see uh, they see the states of America as a bunch of stars all held together on a flag. That's the idea. So I'll take an example that is more relevant to the rest of my childhood, which was growing up in Australia, and cricket. And cricket, if you understand cricket, it helps you to understand the way Australians look at the world. So, because we tend to look at cricket like a, um, as, a as a metaphor for life. So I'll give you an example. You have, according to uh, Turner, the exegetical meaning of cricket, which is what, if I as an anthropologist go and interview a cricket player and say, well, what is this game cricket? You say, well, there's two sides, and the batting side goes and scores runs, and the fielding side tries to get the batting side out. So that's the, that's the exegetical meaning. The operational meaning is somebody actually going out and playing cricket, whether they're batting or fielding. And here we have the current world superstar of batting, Vera Kohli, um, actually batting in cricket. So that's, he's operationalizing the symbol of cricket here. But as a positional meaning, that's where it becomes interesting. Because if I go to a funeral, if somebody has lived a long life, they'll often say he had a good innings. That means he was out there for a long time. Um, if somebody, uh, like if somebody bowls at you, which is like pitching in cricket, if somebody bowls at you and it's a bit strange or weird and it's hard to judge what's happening, you let it through to the keeper, which means if, if it's a bit like in baseball talk, if you let a curveball through to the catcher without swinging at it, you just stood back. Um, trying to think of some other analogies to explain this. And the problem is it's difficult for me to explain it unless you understand cricket. And it's, so it's thus difficult for me to explain aspects of Australian life unless you understand cricket. Um, people were talking about being hit for six. That's a feeling like when you um, feel deflated and exhausted and hopeless, which is how a bowler or a pitcher feels when the batter gets um, hits the ball over the boundary, which is the equivalent for baseball of hitting a home run. So when you get hit for six, it's like, uh, there's no expression in baseball, be like getting hit for a home run or... Uh, um, I don't, if if soccer was if soccer was what an example would be like um, letting one through to the net or something like that. Okay, um, so that's cricket. And now I talk about baseball, which is probably even more so than cricket because baseball is phenomenally important in understanding life in North America. And here I have a photo of Smoke, who's my favourite player this year from the Jays. He's not my favourite player. Sorry, he's doing very well for the Blue Jays. And think about baseball. Um, if I go and talk to a Smoke and say, okay, what's this, uh, what's this baseball about? He says, well, if you're a batter, you go out there and you try and get a base hit. And if you're a pitcher, you try and get me, the batter, out. Then there's the operational thing, which is Justin Smoke going out and actually batting. That's putting baseball into operation. But then you can also think of baseball as a symbol of life. And now, I mean such a rich metaphorical uh, uh, world of baseball that like um, you talk about somebody stepping up to the plate which means ready to face adversity to hit a home run means to do something very successfully on two strikes means um, just about to get in big trouble to strike out means to fail miserably to touch base means to make connect connect with somebody to give a ballpark figure means to be somewhere to what else to um, to throw a curveball means to do something unexpected. Something from left field is something weird, and I could go on and on and on. So the idea is that if you're an American who follows baseball, you see the world through baseball in the same way that the um, Ndumbu person sees the landscape through the fork stick, you see the world through baseball. Another example from my own field work is about Jukung. So if I spoke to people on Cocos Islands where I do field work, 
So now, you know, um, these are actually not, I've got Balinese Jukung here, uh, not, not Kokos Jukung, but we'll use these Balinese Jukung anyway. Um, uh, the people on the, on the Kokos Island would say, oh, we used to use Jukung, these, these boats, for fishing, and, uh, and they'd tell me about different features of the Jukung, which you can see at this um, blog I've done, indicated below. That's the exegetical meaning. The operational meaning is actually when they actually sail, when people get the jukung out, especially after um, Hari Raya, which is Edel Fit or Edel Fitri, they um, take the jukung out and race them. But there's also, you can look at the world through um, the jukung, because the jukung itself explains things like fertility. There's a, there's a part of the uh, um, jukung that's called a kone, which is like the um, foreskin of a penis. And it also um, is related to coming of age and marriage. The foreskin is related to those things and also related to the jukung. So in a sense, if you believe Turner's theory, the way the Cocos Islander looks, Cocos Malay person looks at the world, is through a jukung. So to take it back to the Ndumbu then, the Chishinga is a unitary power. Um, the fork stick sort of sums up and contains this slaughterous power of the hunting cult. So every kind of hunting right itself an epitome for of a whole sector of Ndumbu culture. A quintessential feature is the temporary shrine, the fork stick or chishinga, which is erected to the hunter ancestor. So hunting rituals explain, uh, epitomize a large aspect of Ndumbu culture and the fork stick epitomizes the hunting right. In the same way, for example, um, baseball epitomizes a large aspect or sector of North American culture. Or cricket epitomizes, particularly batting, epitomizes a whole aspect of Australian and also English uh, culture, and I suppose Indian too. So when you look at these powerful symbols, they have three aspects. They have the exegetical aspect, which is what other anthropologists might call the folk explanation. A folk explanation might be like this. The words AD mean after death of Christ. That's what I used to think as a child. When I became a scholar, I found out that it actually means Anno Domini, year of year of Christ. So the folk explanation isn't necessarily, we don't actually necessarily treat it as accurate, but rather a reflection of certain ideas about culture. So they might, the indimble person might say that Chishinga comes from the word um, cursed, but actually a philologist or a linguist might come along and say, actually, there's no relation between the two words at all. So we don't necessarily, necessarily take uh, folk understanding or local understanding at face value. If a child, Australian child tells you that AD means after death, you don't actually accept that as fact, but look at that in relation to the person's age and what kind of information they have about blah, 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 blah. So um, another word for it would be an emic understanding. So that's the exegesis. There's also the operation, the way it's used in practice, particularly in rituals. And then there's the positional meaning, which is how the symbol helps us understand the world, how it contextualizes aspects of our experience or of our whole um, symbolic system. And we'll see later in another presentation from this course, this is what Ortner calls a key symbol, which elaborates. It's an elaborate. So Ortner would call the fork stick uh, an elaborating key symbol. So this theory of symbols that Turner gives us tells us, tells us that symbols don't just mean things, that they actually also do things. And this connects with speech act theory and linguistic anthropology. Speech act theory would be something like me saying, hmm, it's warm in here. What I'm not doing is actually commenting so much on the heat, 
but asking my wife to turn the air conditioner or the heater down. So if I say, mm, it's warm in here, I'm actually doing something else. What the words mean and what they do are different things. This is also part of linguistic anthropology. If my boss walks in and says, wow, it's warm in here, I'd say, yes, boss, it really, really is warm. I'm not just stating about how warm the how the room is. I'm also trying to get on well with my boss and trying to connect with them and get some sort of solidarity. So in other words, what speech act theory, what linguistic anthropology and what Victor Turner do is tell us that it's not just what symbols mean, it's what they do as well. Now, how else could this be analysed? I mean, uh, Fraser would talk about this in terms of um, the magical beliefs, the beliefs um, that there's a spirit that can be separated from the body and placed separately in, for example, an inanimate or animate object like the uh, golden bough. And I think he, if he'd known about the fork stick, he would have got pretty excited because he would say, well, the answer, the a part of this, he would say that you know, the, the, the spirit of the hunter is being kept in the fork stick for safekeeping. I imagine that's what Fraser would say. Whether he'd be correct, I'm not sure. Freud would probably, and probably with some justification, talk about it as a kind of phallic symbol, a symbol of the penis. And you could relate that to other um, theorists such as Obersecker looking at um, penises and hair. Um, Durkheim would see it as uniting something that the cult, members of the cult can unite around. The chichinga or fork stick provides unity for the group. So you can see, I could, I could keep on going, but the point is that it's quite a um, useful symbol for anthropologists too. To You can use different theories to explain it in different ways. Um, aside from that, what you've got to, from my presentation today is an introduction to Turner, who's been influential in the anthropological study of symbols, an acquaintance with this very important symbol, which is the forked stick, which is used as an example, for example, by Sherry Ortner, and a little bit of an acquaintance with the Mdumbu. Okay, thanks for listening and I look forward to your company for some more presentations.